welcome back to my channel. If you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, I'll be looking at the hospital frontalis. The hospital frontalis is a muscle just from here breaking down the name that extends from the frontal region down to the hospital region. Right on with me as I unfold the morphology of the hospital frontalis, the actions that this muscle exhibits, the blood supply, and also its innovations. The occipital frontalis muscle is a long, wide epicranial muscle that is seen to span from the anterior region down to the posterior region. But specifically, you see it running from the high bro, which is located in the anterior part, to the superior nocal line that is located behind. So you see this region here demarcated in dotted black, forming an alignment of the occipital frontalis. So you see it spanning from this region in the anterior part here, where we have the eyebrow. Then you see it running posteriorly, where it is finally inserted on the superior nocal line. We'll be dwelling on the superior nocal line as we go through with this lecture to see the specific region of the occipital bone where this muscle is inserted upon. So structurally, the occipital frontalis is made up of Paired frontal bellies, and this is what is harrowed here in yellow. We have two frontal bellies of this occipital frontalis muscle, and this is located in the anterior part, which means that we have one on the right, we also have another on the left. And posteriorly, we have the paired occipital bellies, and this is what is harrowed here in blue. This means that we have two occipital bellies too, which of course, we have one on the right side and we have another on the left side. So we have paired frontal bellies at the front and we have paired occipital bellies behind. And in between, we have the aponeurosis. And this is what is harrowed here in green. So this means that the aponeurosis is located between the frontal bellies and also the occipital belly. So this is like an aponeurosis of the occipital frontalis. So these are the three structural components of the occipital to frontalis. We would be taking each of these components one after the other to see what they are structurally made up of, also to dwell more on where they are specifically inserted upon. Going first on the bellies, in our previous slide, we already established that we have four bellies. We have two bellies at the front and we have another two behind. We have the frontal bellies which are paired and this is located in the anterior part. And this is what is highlighted here in red. These bellies are quadrangular in shape, which means that they have a somewhat four-sided shape. And this is what is presented in this image here. We also have behind, we have paired hospital bellies. This is also quadrangular in shape. And if you see the pattern of these bellies, you see that they present a four-sided configuration. Looking at the features of the frontal bellies, we already established that it is located in the anterior part. And if you look at the configuration here, you see that they appear to be fused together. These two bellies are seen to be connected together in the anterior part. This is where we have the frontal bellies here. If you look at the posterior end of the frontal bellies, you see that we have the emergence of the aponeurosis. And this is what is presented in this image. But in the anterior part, this muscle is not connected to bone. This means that the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis does not have a bony connection. So in the anterior part, what is it then connected? connected with. If you look at this image, down here is where we have the high, and of course at the upper part of the high, we have the high bro. The high bro is like an elevation that is seen at the upper part of the high. And this elevation that tends to create the high bro region is formed by a number of muscles. We have the procerus muscle in the medial side that is seen to fill up the glabella. The glabella is seen between the two eyebrows. So we have the procerus muscle in the medial side. The more medial to the procerus, we have the corrugator supercilium muscle. This muscle is seen at the medial side of the high brow, and this is what is seen to form the medial region of the high brow. The more lateral is where we have the obicularis oculi. So at this region here that is highlighted in black is where we have the high brow region, and this region we've stated that it is formed by a number of muscles as we've highlighted. So it is this muscle that creates connection points with the fibers 
of the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis. So you have the frontal belly here, highlighted in red, as it is seen in this image. So you have fibers from this muscle merging with fibers of the procerus at the medial side of the high. And this is what is highlighted here in dotted blue. So the medial region, we have the corrugator supercellular muscle, and this is what is highlighted here in yellow. So you also have fibers of the frontal bellies also merging with this muscle at this region. Then more lateral, we have the obicularis oculi. So we also have fibers of the frontal belly also merging with the obicularis oculis, both at the lateral side. So you see that the muscles that seem to form the structural components of the hybrid region are seen to merge with fibers of the frontal belly of the hospital frontalis muscle. So you see that at this point, these frontal bellies are not connected to bone, but are connected to the fibers of muscles that form the hybrid region. And this kind of presentation that we have on this side will also be seen on the other side. And if you remember, when we tried to describe the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle, we said that the frontal bellies are closely packed together. So if they are closely positioned around this space, it means that the fibers will be merging with the fibers of the muscle that is located in the median side. And this is the procerus. And that is why it has a connection with the procerus muscle that is located on the median side of the eye, which, of course, is a muscle that's seen to fill up the glabella. The glabella, we said that is the same between the two eyebrow regions. And if you go more medial to that region, you have the corrugator supercilium muscle. And of course, going more laterally is where you have the ubicularis oculi. So those are the three muscles that are arranged from the median side to the medial region, then to the lateral region of the eyebrow. And of course, this muscle will create connection points with the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. So as this is projected, we see that the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis are not structurally connected to bone. What they are connected with are the fibers of muscles that are seen around the hybrid region. Okay, looking at this image down here, this is where we have the frontal belly. See that the frontal belly, of course, is located at the front. But if you look at the anterior side, at this region here that is harrowed here in yellow, you see that the fibers from the frontal belly that seem to merge with fibers of muscles forming the eyebrow region. So that is what is presented here in this image. So going to the hospital belly, which is the belly that seen behind. And of course, if you look at the configuration of this belly using this image up here, you see that they are separated. If you try to compare their placement with the frontal bellies, you see that the frontal bellies are fused together why the hospital bellies are separated. And this separation, of course, is as a result of the placement of this muscle. So this is where we have the hospital belly. We have one on this side and we have another one on the other side. And if you look at the way they are positioned, you see that they're actually spaced. In trying to use this image down here to explain the reason why we have the space created between the two hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis. If you look at this image down here, this is where we have the external hospital protuberance. We talked about this external hospital protuberance in our previous lecture on the scalp. If you want to check up that lecture, please kindly go and check that lecture up to keep yourself informed. We said that the external hospital protuberance is like a swollen region that is seen around the base of the hospital bone. We know that the hospital bone has a posterior part, and of course, it's seen to extend also from the base of the skull. So the extension around the base of the skull is where you have this prominence of bone that is referred to as the external hospital protuberance. So lateral to the external hospital protuberance, we have the superior nuchal line that is harrowed here in black. We have one on this side and we have another on the other side. So you have the superior nuchal line extending from the external hospital protuberance laterally. Then if you further see this alignment, in relation to the placement of the hospital bellies, this hospital belly is located at the lateral to third of the superior nuchal line. So if you try to divide the superior nuchal line to three, the lateral to third region is where you have the placement of the hospital belly. 
Also on this side, the lateral to third region is where you have the placement of the occipital belly. So you have one belly on the right and you have another on the left. So if you consider the pattern by which they are placed on the specific region of the superior nuchal line, you see that they will be creating a space around the medial side because they are placed on the lateral to third of the superior nuchal line. And if it is on the lateral side, the two bellies are placed on the lateral side, it means that at the medial side there is going to be the creation of a space and that is why we have this space created at this region so the space that is created between the two hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis is as a result of the placement along the superior nuchal line because they are specifically placed around the lateral to third of the superior nuchal line so if you look at this image here this is where we have the hospital belly on one side and the hospital belly of the other side is located deep to this image. It is not shown in this image because it's more like a lateral view. So you can see that where they are placed is on the lateral to toad of the superior nuchal line because they are placed on the lateral side. And that is what is seen to be presented in this image. The last structural component, which is the aponeurosis. The aponeurosis is a tendon-like sheet that is made up of dense fibrous tissue. And this structure is seen to connect the frontal bellies with the occipital belly. So this is where we have the aponeurosis here, harrowed in red. It is seen between the two bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. This aponeurosis can also be referred to as the epicranial aponeurosis or gallia aponeurotica. This is actually the third layer of the scalp. When we try to describe the layers of the scalp, we say that the scalp is made up of five layers. And the third layer of the scalp is the aponeurotic layer. And this aponeurotic layer is actually the aponeurosis that is formed between between the frontal and the hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. So this is what is seen at the third layer of the scalp. Okay, looking at this image down here, this is where we have the aponeurosis. You can see that it has a tendon-like sheet appearance. And of course, it seems to be connecting the frontal with the hospital belly. So on the anterior side, you see that it begins from the posterior end of the frontal bellies. So if you look at this image up here, this is where we have the frontal bellies. And if you look at it, there's an emergence from the posterior end of frontal belly. And this emergence is where the aponeurosis, of course, begins from. And of course, you see it being directed posteriorly. So using this image down here, this is where the aponeurosis, of course, begins from at the posterior end of the frontal belly. And of course, as they extend from this region, you see the aponeurosis being directed posteriorly. So let's see where this aponeurosis is connected to posteriorly. So as it drives posteriorly, you see that it parts between the two hospital bellies. Using this image up here, remember we already described that the hospital bellies are spaced. Because of this space that is presented between the two hospital bellies, you now see the aponeurosis parting between the hospital bellies. So this is what is harrowed here in black. And after this, they are finally inserted on the external hospital protuberance and also the medial one third of the superior nuchal line. So using this image to explain the posterior connection of the aponeurosis, we already said that the superior nuchal line at the lateral to third is where we have the placement of the hospital belly, thereby leaving the medial one third open. So the space that is created between the two hospital bellies will then be the medial one third on the right side and also the medial one third on the left side, which of course is on the superior nuchal line. So this is the region here in between the two hospital bellies. And remember we talked about the external hospital protuberance that is harrowed here in green. This is where we have the emergence of the superior nuchal line moving lateral words from the external hospital protuberance here that is harrowed in green. So we have fibers of this aponeurosis inserting on the external hospital protuberance here and also taking their space onto the medial one third of the superior nuchal line. Remember the superior nuchal line, when we try to divide it into three sub regions, we said the lateral two third is taken up by the hospital belly. Why the medial one third? We create an insertion site for the aponeurosis. This kind of presentation on this side will also be seen on the other side. So we also have the medial one third of the superior nuchal line 
also being taken up by the aponeurosis. So this is the kind of configuration that is seen by the aponeurosis of the frontalis muscle. So if you try to look at this image down here, this is where we have the hospital belly. And if you look at it at this side that is high radiant and green, you see that we have the aponeurosis extending between the two hospital bellies because we have one on this side and we have another one on the other side. You have these tendon-like sheets, you know, spreading in between the two hospital bellies. So this is the kind of configuration that is seen in this image. So not talking about the actions of this muscle. So talking about the frontal belly. The frontal belly is helped to elevate the high ball so because of the action of the frontal belly of the spittal frontalis. And if we try to do this, we also have the scalp being moved backward. Also, the production of wrinkling effect around the forehead region is also the action of the frontal bellies of the spittal frontalis. So when we try to form a wrinkle effect around the forehead region, it is as a result of the contraction of the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. Also, if you look at the occipital belly, the occipital belly is responsible for the retraction of the scalp. You are able to draw the scalp backwards because of the action of the occipital bellies. So these are the actions that are exhibited by the occipital frontalis muscle. Then going to the blood supply, the frontal bellies and also the occipital bellies are supplied by different vessels. As we've described in our previous slide, the position of the frontal bellies and the occipital bellies are different. We know that the frontal bellies are located in the anterior part, while the occipital bellies are located in the posterior part. Of course, these two bellies will be supplied by vessels around the region where they are located. So from the frontal bellies, because it's located at the front, the frontal bellies will be supplied by the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery, we know that is a branch of the internal carotid artery. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is a branch from the common carotid. So from the internal carotid artery is where we have the ophthalmic artery that is already in blue. And you see it's being directed towards the anterior Part where it will be given supply to the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis. Then you also have branches from the superficial temporal artery. Now, if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the common carotid artery here that is arrowed in yellow. We know the common carotid will divide into the internal carotid here, arrowed in green, and external carotid here that is arrowed in purple. From the external carotid is where we have the emergence of the superficial temporal artery around the temporal region. And you see it giving off branches to the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis, where it also gives supply to them. So you see that the frontal bellies are supplied by vessels around that region. So going to the hospital belly, we have branches from the posterior auricular artery and also the hospital artery. These two arteries are branches from the external carotid artery. We already established a common carotid here in yellow, dividing into the internal carotid that is arrowed in green and also the external carotid that is arrowed in purple. So from the external carotid, we have the posterior auricular artery that is harrowed here in red. And we also have the occipital artery that is also harrowed here in red. These two arteries, you can see that the emergence is directed around the posterior region. And this is where they give off branches to supply the hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. So the frontal and the hospital bellies are supplied by different vessels. So we have branches from both the internal carotid and also the external carotid arteries supplying the occipital frontalis. For the ophthalmic artery, we know it's a branch of the internal carotid artery. While the other arteries, which include the superficial temporal artery, the posterior auricular and also the occipital arteries are branches from the external carotid artery. Then going to the innervations of the occipital frontalis, the occipital frontalis is supplied by a facial nerve. So facial nerve gives off branches to supply both the frontal bellies and also the occipital bellies. So we have different branches of the facial nerve that tends to give innervations to the occipital frontalis. So we have the facial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve, giving supply to both the frontal bellies and also the occipital bellies. So for the frontal bellies, we have the temporal branch of the facial nerve, giving branches to supply the frontal bellies. Then the occipital bellies, we have the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve supplying the occipital bellies. So we can see that both the frontal and the occipital bellies are supplied by branches from the facial nerve. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.